Makarios, a devotional for the season of Lent, produced by Northside Church. Thursday, March 28th. It's Monday, Thursday. Flourishing are the peacemakers. Our scripture passage for today is Matthew 26, verses 47 through 54. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for the sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? After eating the Passover meal with his disciples, his closest friends and most intimate followers, Jesus goes to the garden to pray. It is at this moment that Judas enacts the betrayal which will lead to Jesus' death. Scripture makes it clear that throughout this experience, Jesus knows what is coming. He knows that his entire group of friends will soon desert him, yet still he communes with them and confides in them. He knows Judas will betray him, yet still he calls him friend. When one of his followers attacks in an attempt to protect Jesus, Jesus reprimands him. In Luke's version of this same story, Jesus not only reprimands, but heals the resulting wound. Even in his darkest moments, Jesus is focused on peace and the well-being of his foes. Jesus is not interested in violent uprising against evil or a physical fight for justice. He is willing to give up his very life in order to exemplify peace rather than fight to continue his mission by staying alive. Jesus even affirms that he has the ability to call forth heavenly forces to fight, and yet he does not. Because fighting, even for the most noble cause, is not the way of a peacemaker. So this week we uh, have been talking about what it means to be a peacemaker uh, as the kind of final culmination of, of the path of Makarios, this path of flourishing life that Jesus has laid out for us. And the final step, the final stage is that we are peacemakers. Flourishing are the peacemakers. Um, this is what a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like. And here in the garden, in Jesus' final moment of freedom, that he's going to have, he he uh, embodies what it means to be a peacemaker for us uh, in this story. I think, uh, as you highlighted in, in what you wrote here, he calls Judas friend, and then uh, in the Luke version of the story, not only does he reprimand the guy who steps forward, who I think is Peter uh, in that Luke version, uh, of course, because of course, it of is, course, it's Peter. It's Peter. Uh, not only does he reprimand Peter, but he also heals the one uh, that got struck in the ear or got his ear cut off. And uh, mind you, this is one of the guys that's coming to arrest him. Right. Uh, he heals this man. So rather than fight, even though the cause might be noble, I think the way you put that is really good. Uh, Jesus embodies peace here, and this is his last act of freedom. And I think this kind of strikes me as something. Uh, that's valuable. This is the last time Jesus will make a free decision uh, on his own. And he decides to use that moment of freedom to say, no, no, we don't use violence and heal somebody who is ostensibly his enemy in this moment. Um, that is that is striking. It's uh, incredibly humbling. right? I mean, if you talk about it in that terms of freedom like that, I mean, how much freedom do we have every day in our lives and we use that freedom Right. To do all kinds of damage, you, you know, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. here's this human being that's looking death and the human being, this divine human being, whatever you want to call him, you know, that's looking death in the eye and the last thing. He's still thinking about everybody else. Right. Right. 
And you can tell, I mean, what Jesus is embodying here is not just being a peacemaker, but it's every single one of these stages that we have been uh, discussing throughout the season of Lent here now in the final week as it culminates with peacemakers. But Jesus is embodying being poor in self. You know, he's embodying, I think, the grief that comes with violence. You know, he's embodying the yielding, obviously, uh, and he wants right relationship, oh, and he's being merciful, and all of these things, all of these things, because his one desire is to do God's will. In this moment, you can kind of see all seven stages of Makarios being embodied in Jesus. And he doesn't do this because it's unique to Jesus. Everything Jesus does is supposed to be an example to us. It's something that we are supposed to do. And so I'm just thinking, like, we are not often confronted <laughs> in the way that Jesus is in this moment. Like, we are not often confronted with a crowd or a mob of people who want to arrest us um, or who want to do harm to us physically in the way that Jesus is, is confronting us here. That does happen, uh, but not often, not on a daily basis. Um, and yet, in that moment, Jesus decides to to exemplify the kingdom of God, which is a kingdom of peace. And that's really what we've been talking about all week, trying to connect this... Uh, the message of Jesus with the cross and and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, as he heads toward the cross, Jesus is embodying this nonviolence and this peace that he that is exactly what he's calling us to do. Yeah, I, I mean, this is it, I I the more we talk about this, the more I see it. The idea that these these things build on each other, and in order to be these peacemakers we do we have to these other these other steps are the tools in that step you know i was going back and looking at our table of contents over the whole thing um you know in order to like you said in order to have the wherewithal and the self-control to act that way in that moment when you know you're gonna die you know because or anything generalize it right you know something bad is about to happen you are scared you are um worried yeah. you are you know whatever those those emotions might be when you know something is you know something bad is about to happen to you um and then you're suddenly being confronted by people you know you've got violence right in front of you you know all these this storm is yeah. happening and in order to be that peacemaker in that situation we do we have to learn how to think of god's plan instead of our own right put god your name not mine yeah the one that's really striking me in this moment is the grief piece you know yeah. because i think for me a lot of times grief comes out as anger yeah. and and so learning how to, to understand that God has comforted you, you know, experience the comfort that God offers so that that grief can be dealt with appropriately. And so yeah. that it doesn't come out in that moment as violence, anger, you know, yielding to the people around you, um, learning how to hunger and thirst for the things that are of God and not of the self. Right. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it, it is... It is truly a culmination. It is, and um, it says a lot about about what Jesus is is trying to accomplish. I mean, think about think about how quickly this situation could have escalated and gotten out of control, right? I mean, this is this is one of Jesus's disciples stepping forward with a sword and cutting off a guy's ear, and these guys have been sent with authority to arrest Jesus. Uh, they could have slaughtered all of the disciples right there. I mean, they mm -hmm. could have been a fight. It could have been, who knows what would have happened. Right. Yeah. And then what Jesus is on the run or, or all the disciples are dead and Jesus dies right there in the garden. I mean, like who knows what could have happened. Right. Yeah. So like there, the, the situation there, uh, Jesus is truly like literally making peace in that moment. Um, and, and really what I find interesting there is even in this moment, Jesus Jesus prefers to embody righteousness, right relationship, uh, in the face of what is truly injustice. Like he he prefers to have injustice done upon him than to break right relationship, which looks like mercy and healing in this moment, uh, and and embodying that peace. So it, that's it's a it's an extreme example, but it's one that I think is meant to instruct us. Uh, as disciples, like Jesus does this because he's empowered with the Holy Spirit. He does this because he is the Son of God, but he's the Messiah. He is the model and what we are trying to be. You know, when, whenever we say we're going to follow Jesus, this is what we're following him to into these moments where, I don't know, like, like you said, like when something is looming and anxiety starts to grow, 
you know, I think anger and violence can be easily uh, come to the tip of, of our tongue and can come to uh, the forefront of our heart. Um, any conversations that we get into with people, they can escalate and get out of control. Arguments or uh, disagreements, uh, <laughs> and we bring traffic up as an example time and time again. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet here, you know, in a, in a world where, man, all it seems like all we see is escalations of violence, whether it's on a global scale between nations or peoples, um, or it's in homes, or it's in schools, or it's at concerts. I mean, it seems like anytime somebody gets upset, I mean, somebody's going to draw a sword or a gun, and violence just escalates all the time, and all it does is create that that's i mean all it does is cause reason for grief grieving and mourning um and it certainly doesn't bring together unity it doesn't bring anybody together and and it doesn't matter what the cause is and i think that that's maybe what's jumping out to me right here in this moment uh, as you highlighted in what you wrote is that even for a noble cause even for a just cause violence is not what we do as members and citizens of the kingdom of god it's not what Jesus did. And that's a hard message. That's a hard message. That's something that's hard for us to learn because the world has taught us so thoroughly that you answer, uh, you know, might makes right. Like you answer injustice with power and violence and you've solved the problem. And here we're learning, I think what we're seeing is that whatever the kingdom of God is, it's not that. And that's where our allegiance ultimately is. It's with the kingdom of God and with the king who is Jesus Christ. Power is an interesting dynamic here, too, because as we're talking about what this scene looks like in that moment, you say, you know, it could go any way. You know, this could have ended catastrophically, a different kind of catastrophic than how right, it did. Right, yeah. um, but Jesus's action in that moment is in a way taking power of the situation over the situation. Yeah. And that is really striking to me. So, and, and then you use the word empowered by the spirit. And I think that's a key difference for me, right? It's, um, how do I, the way that I want to feel power in this situation as an anxious, troubled human being, yeah. how do I want to feel power? Because those are all those the opposites of all the things we've been talking about. Yeah versus how do I find my power in God, in the spirit, and realize that these peacemaking actions or non-actions, whatever yeah. they may be in that situation, is actually the way to take power in the situation, the, good, the, the right kind That's of right. way, the, the humble way to take power. Because he is, he is taking control of that situation and putting it right through healing. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. I think it's important to remember, you know, again, Jesus does this because he's empowered with the Holy Spirit. So that's what's giving him the ability to do this. And, that, and the same Holy Spirit has been poured out into us. So we're not doing it on our own. We, you know, God's not asking us to muster up the courage and bravery to do something like this. He's saying, I'll provide that if you just get out of the way. Um, but then secondly, and maybe more importantly, it, and this is true of the entire path of Makarios we've been talking about, the entire life of discipleship. Uh, without doubt, the life of discipleship, if it's true and faithful, always leads to the cross. It always leads to persecution. It always leads to the world trying to silence you, whether that's through violence or manipulation or coercion or whatever. What gives us the hope that we can do these things is not just the fact that we're empowered with the spirit, but that we know that the resurrection is on the other side. And Jesus knows that. And it doesn't make it any easier in that moment. But that's yeah. one of the things that uh, also encourages and motivates and pushes Jesus forward in this moment is that he knows the resurrection. He believes the resurrection. And Jesus' resurrection, as I've said in our classes this week many times, Jesus' resurrection is not just for him. It's a promise for us. It's a promise for anyone who will be on this path of flourishing, who will be faithful as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That should empower us. I mean, that should motivate us. That should give us the hope and the faith and the courage we need to be able to stand down from every fight that we come up against, to be able to yield and to be able to be agents of peace rather than... Uh, rather than people who are even trying to fight for what is right, because that's not the point. The victory's already been won in Jesus Christ. It's already been won in the cross and in the resurrection. 
Our job is not to win, it's to be faithful. And sometimes that looks like, in Jesus' case here, it looks like him getting arrested. It looks like him actually loving and healing his enemies rather than saying, hey, this isn't right, like, you know, um, or trying to run away or fighting or anything like that. Yeah. Well, that's something to think about uh, this Monday, Thursday, as we as we gather um, today. I will remind everybody, we have a Monday, Thursday service here at the church. There's one we at have. noon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's one at six o'clock. They're both in the Faith and Art Center. We've we've set up a beautiful banquet table for the occasion. I've been told there will be no foot washing, uh, which makes me kind of sad because that's what Jesus did on Monday Thursday. But that's okay. I'm really I'm willing to let that go. Um, but we uh, we will be celebrating and remembering uh, this really really important evening. Uh, in the life of Jesus Christ together as a church here at Northside Church today and invite you guys to come join us as you are are available to do so. Um, Elizabeth, thank you for joining us in this conversation. This is going to be our last talk probably uh, here during this series in Recovery House. I appreciate uh, you walking the path with me. It's been joyful. This has been joyful. This has been joyful. (laughs) Uh, And I appreciate everyone else there uh, out there who has been listening and reading along. Thank you guys for being a part of this. I um, hope that it's been edifying and helpful for you in your path of discipleship. And uh, we'll continue to do it together. Amen.